All right. So we missed Alicia's wonderful response to Mr. Damasio's uh, book. Um, do you want to summarize it again, or do you want to just say? Um, yeah, I'll summarize it. That way he can kind of, it might prompt something in his thoughts, or he may have a response to it. Uh, let's see. I was for really overall, I was happy to come across the reading because it goes along with what I'm writing our research and final papers on. Um, and I thought it was interesting to see neuroscience connected to philosophy because of the way the plasticity of the brain allows for changes to the neural network. And then in the second article, uh, we were talking about educating the human soul and how neuroscience has kind of disproven Descartes, Kant, and Locke about humans being a blank slate. And, you know, we have to counteract our ideas because the ideas have the ability to control us or we can control them and that the ideas are who make is the ideas are what makes us who we are or who we become and then on the third one i think my best my favorite part about the third part number nine was the definition of feelings and how he makes a distinction of how emotions are the physical part and feelings are the mental part or the, the thought process. Um, I don't think I had ever seen them like separated that way before. Yeah, he uses the words emotions and feelings, not the way I would probably use them, but you just- A lot of times they're interchangeable. Well, no, this is, and again, I think he's consistent. It's just that it, it always blows me. Okay, emotion is your immediate reaction right to the outside world like your immediate um situation and then feelings are as soon as you start reflecting on them you internalize them and you start thinking about them right um and so in a i think in a trauma situation for example um you know you you uh i don't know you get raped by your uncle right so every time you see your uncle, you're going to have that reaction, right? Strictly emotional reaction. And then you're going to, well, the worst thing is, let's just say a little kid is his father or a teenager. Her father has sex with her and he tells her, this is how I show you I love you, right? It happens. And... um so she, it's a trauma for her, right? It's not pleasant. It's not, but she trusts him, right? She trusts the explanation, <laughs> right? And so then from then on, eventually she finds out this is screwed up, you know? So she still will have that emotion when she sees her dad, but now she has to rewire her thoughts about it, mm -hmm. right? It's not okay, right? And the fact that you have sexual hangups um, with other guys or some, you know, you're developing these um, sexual uh, hangups is not your fault. And so somebody has to talk to her and somebody has to get her to change her ideas. And then her feelings will change, but probably her emotions when she sees her dad, that'll be really hard to actually change, but her feelings can change and her mind can change, but it can only change if she has other people, right? It's a relationship with another person that's gonna be able to change her mind, right? She can't just change it in a vacuum. She might read something, but again, reading something is engagement with another person's mind, but it'd be much better if she could get in an environment where she just didn't see her dad again 
Does that make sense? And that I'm sure that's how psychologists do it. Well, um, they talk about um, well, the example I'm recalling talked about like child and family issues, not unlike that necessarily, but it could have been for any reason. It's really hard to get the family back to where they need to be without moving the children out of the home. Right. So, yeah. And that's just because, I mean, if you had a therapist move in with you, I mean, it's just that you can't create an alternative okay. social. Situation. Not until one o'clock. And so it just reinforces de Koch's claim, von der Koch's claim that we are social by nature, right? Culture is a second nature for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when he says emotions, feelings, ideas, and then the ideas, okay, so we have our body state maps. Like we can't change our breathing. We can't change our digestion. We can't change aging. You know, we can't change. Those are old, old, old maps way down by the brainstem, right? And then he says, but we are social and political creatures by nature. So over time and evolution, we develop these maps. Mm -hmm. And then they got more and more complex. And then ideas started to cause us to be able to deliberately break apart old maps and create new maps and do it the, the motive for doing it is because you're in a different social situation. So all of a sudden, community, um, a broader community, right? I mean, right from when you're born, your parents, like the family community, the community of people you're close to, starts affecting your neural mapping quickly, right? It's just that the kid doesn't necessarily have the idea. But the parents have the idea, right? The people around them have some kind of ideas that are driving what they're doing. Now, some parents are really impulsive, right? And they might be violent or whatever, but somewhere in the back of their mind, those emotions get attached to feelings and somewhere they're telling themselves, well, the kid deserved it or kids need to be kept in, you know, they need authority. There's some justification for it or I was in a bad mood he'll get over it because little kids look like they get over it that's another thing that parents really need to know you know they don't really get over it they look like they do but anyway so the main thing is that this whole process it's best if you get a kid in an environment where the people around them act, they follow the golden rule, right? And they do have these virtues. So then the kid internalizes that. And there is that whole map of virtues. It's not like it's rocket science. And he's saying, Damasio says that if we want to have homeostasis, if we want to flourish, we need these skills in getting along, right? And we need to treat people like the golden rule. He says the golden rule is actually mapped into our neural mapping. It's not just these principles from some prophet or from Kant or something. Um, okay, does that seem fair, Alicia, to what you're getting? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I'm having, I'm still having some weather issues. So if I, come in and out it's because my connection is messing up okay ivy are you still there can you hear me yes yeah i'm still here sorry the um car is like pulling a little bit so i have to pull over but i've i've been following along with what you're saying um basically it's like when we're when your parents are um you're young and they're like you'll forget but then you they never you never really do because there's been studies that show that children don't forget you know even babies they still remember um, 
the environment around them. But your parents, they'll like, they're like, well, he's young in 10, 20, you know, five years, five months from now, he won't even remember this happened, but you do. Well, the body keeps the score. The title of yeah. it is Your Body Remembers. Yeah. And it's like when uh, you get heart transplants in your heart, like they show that your uh, body has muscle memory, like, you know, it feels a certain way about certain things that you, if that makes sense. Why wouldn't it? I mean, it's survival, right? We're talking about survival. And the human body would not have survived this long, you know? It evolved because it adapted and because it has this will to survive. Um, so Spinoza's thing is that we have this natural desire to flourish, right? It's a drive. It's a natural drop. Um, I'm not, okay, let's see. I'm not quite sure how far I want to go into the book. Did you? Okay. Well, I guess, Alicia, do you remember I quoted really briefly from Spinoza that you're supposed to take every emotion? Did, did you read that part? It's okay if I don't, I won't talk about that. If I don't think I got that far. Hold on. Okay. Because I just took a couple excerpts. Um, but let's see, we have I'm just trying to think of how I could cover this class to make that transition so that next time we could talk more about Damasio, right? Because um, Warren's not here and Ivy hasn't read it <laughs> and Alicia. Um, but it does link to the stuff we've done before. So why don't, is it all right if we go over those outlines from von der Koch? Yeah. Okay. And then we'll, I have an outline for, okay. I have an outline for Damasio and I'll just sort of point out to you the connections. Um, I've never taught it in this particular order before, but I'm, I'm glad Alicia's here to sort of go, oh, you know, so you can tell me if it makes sense, the order that I've taught stuff in. Um, there's a couple things I think I would change. I'd put James a little earlier, but um, let's just start this. And if you feel like you've lost the track of the discussion, please speak up, okay? Just say, wait, you know, I want to get this. It just means you're following it. So I would definitely want you to interrupt me as soon as like, eh. <laughs> My neural map just, you know, I'm trying to develop this and all of a sudden, eh, eh, no, I can't, I can't do it. So just let me know, okay? Um, let's see. So let's go to um, the outline for, let's see. I know I made those outlines. Did I, let's see. Well, there was one of them that I had trouble opening. Really? Dang. Um, isn't, isn't that the one that I told you about on Friday? That when I tried to open it, it was blank? Yeah, except that I think I fixed it. Well, but anyway. you emailed me and said you did. But okay. Now I'm not seeing any outlines on there. Okay, but you've got it up. Okay. Well, I don't think I put outline on my title of the thing, which is stupid. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So he's talking about treating trauma. All right. So, so Damasio is partly talking about a healthy psyche that never gets traumatized in the first place. Right. So what would you say? How could you define what trauma is? Well, trauma is when you have an experience with the outside world, this would be in Damasio's language that really violates this, our natural pursuit of wisdom, which is a microcosm in the macrocosm. The truth is that the universe is ordered, that the universe is constantly getting more and more complex, that the natural biosphere is ordered, 
that our consciousness emerged from this because we could understand that order and everything every living thing wants to flourish and it succeeds if everything it does is conducive to its own flourishing now most animals are pretty good at that right <laughs> Like most birds make pretty good nests with whatever they have around where most college students have no nesting instincts. Like how can you live in this? <laughs> so human beings are the ones that you say, wait a second, why are we called the rational creature when we're the stupidest, right? We do all this stupid self-destructive stuff. Well, we have self-conscious awareness and we have choice we're aware that we have options right so that's why the natural process is for the human species to adapt to the natural world and to constantly examine so that culture is integrated with nature so that you can optimize the standard of living people have the middle class that as many people as possible have access to that standard of living and that you keep pushing forward as things change you make sure the changes occur to preserve a middle class then people everybody wants to flourish so you want everybody to flourish and this is not utopia it's a model against which you judge whether something is healthy or perverted, right? Remember we went through moral relativism and that, you know, it, that's if you don't have a model, everything is relative. And I was just like, that has been so harmful because it means nobody has any idea of where we're going. And if you try to say where we're going, oh, you're intolerant, you know, like you're a bigot. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, so let's just say every kid is born, you want them to flourish. There are very few mothers. Every mother, I think, except, you know, there are exceptions, they get messed up. But mothers want their children to flourish, I would say, unless they're drug addicts or something. You know, there are things that happen where the mother gets messed up. But it's natural for mothers to want their kids to flourish. They would want them to grow up in healthy environments because they know the kid is affected by everyone around them. And so when a trauma is when a kid or an adult, the one David guy was 23 years old when he was a lifeguard, the guys who go to war, you know, they're in their 20s. It can happen at any point of life. But trauma is when you have an emotion, there's some event that happens that triggers a very, very deep-seated emotion, right? The brainstem. And it's fear. It's a fear reaction, right? You're threatened. So trauma is, is about fear. Now, sexual drive, sexual attraction is also very deep, but it's positive, right? So you don't say, I was traumatized by my attraction to this girl down, you know, in my class, <laughs> you're not traumatized by that, but you can get obsessed about it and you can become a stalker. And in that obsession, you can become violent because you want that pleasure, right? So that pleasure can lead to a very unhealthy aggression. But let's just take trauma. Trauma is where your relation to the outside world has, um, Ha is unnatural, right? It's an excess level of violence. Um, some amount of vulnerability, we are vulnerable and we're aware of it. So there is this need for aggression. There's healthy aggression. There's appropriate aggression. But usually trauma is about excess. In war, it is not natural to kill your own species. That, that just messes with your mind, right? And so the David or whatever the name was of the guy that when he was in Vietnam, 
he panicked and started killing women and children. And then when he got married and had a kid, he panicked because he was just aware that anybody could pick up a gun and mow them down, you know, including himself. So that's the trauma is when your immediate relation to the outside world triggers this incredibly deep seated disruptive emotion. And so you have to figure out as you process it into a feeling, into an idea, an idea of an idea, you get in a different environment, you have to just work that out to the point where you can deal, you know, deal with the memory of the experience. You can somehow have a feeling that can overcome that, that, you know, I've read where women who were raped, you know, it takes a long time, but they'll say something like, okay, this experience have, has given me my sense of mission and I want to be a counselor for rape victims. And a lot of the Persephone's in the goddesses stories, that's what they decide, right? It's my destiny to do this. I didn't choose it, but I can do it. And when it becomes a positive feeling, right? So when you can associate that memory and you can trigger it to that's why I can be a really good rape counselor. Like the only people who are good at this are the ones who've been raped. That's when you've resolved it. And you can take it on this neural mapping and you can you know, be more, even more committed to making sure people get along, to following the golden rule, and you can flourish. Um, so that would be what you need to do. That would be therapy. Now, do you need a therapist to do it? Well, I, I think profession, well, you know, there are bad ones. There are therapists that do more harm than good. There are therapists that don't really are effective because the patient doesn't bond with them for some reason. Or, oh, but ideally, right? If the girl who's raped is really confused and doesn't know who to go to, what to do, if, you know, the parents just pity her or, you know, it's beyond what they know what to do. And if she can get a good therapist, but the idea is that would be the goal was to somehow take that and, tr and get it triggered to some creative activity, right? I am gonna be honestly a better person for having endured this because I have more empathy with people. Even if you don't become a rape counselor, you could be a great high school teacher because you would have empathy. You would be able to spot a kid. You would just have so much more insight than somebody who's naive. So if you can, and that's the whole thing about eros and thanatos, we have a creative drive and we have a destructive drive. And the destructive one is just self-preservation, but in trauma, it just goes off the rails because people can be perverted. Pervert means misguided. The eros is misguided. It's turned toward violence. And um, okay, so that would be the overall big picture. And then how do you get, you know, from the need to engage the safety system of the brain, right? So the person has to, after that experience, has to feel safe enough to be able to reflect. So that's where you go from emotions to feelings. You start being able to reflect. And so you're not in a constant panic mode. So he, you know, the way Mr. Von der Koch explains it. So this is for me, I, I know what I want to talk about, and then each one of them has a different language, which is frustrating, <laughs> but that's what happens. We are way over-specialized. Nobody talks to anybody outside of their own little narrow whatever, but we're talking about people, 
I mean, just remember, we're talking about people. They're actually there. <laughs> Don't let the language get in the way. But if you think it's a blank slate, then you literally think your language is going to reform the blank slate. And then people won't talk to each other. They'll actually think that person over there is damaging the project because I'm doing it the right way and they're totally wrong. If we have a blank slate, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, so would you say, my internet cut out when I was making a note of what you were saying. You, you, know, you were saying how you engage the safety system of the brain is done through reflection and then you cut out. And I was going to say, you know, through communication and other relationships also, but I wasn't right. sure what you finished. Okay. okay. Right. Actually, I think the reflection, it's really, really hard for someone to do it on their own. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, that's why I teach philosophy. Cause when I, just for me that I needed to read Plato, like when I read Plato's dialogues, I didn't know there was a subject matter, right? I mean, it was, what is piety? It's like, I think about that. The next week it's, what is virtue? I think about that. And then it's, what is just, I think, you know, but it never occurred to me that I thought that was just me musing about when I'm doing this or that. It's a whole subject matter. But it is until college that you're actually, your brain is really, um, developed enough that you can do it just by having a teacher and reading some books that, that trigger that part of your brain. But um, if you're traumatized when you're young, you really need help and you really need to trust the people who are, who are trying to help because you're not going to be able to understand it yourself very well, right? So you just have to have people that will put you in a safe place and you can start to remember the memory. That's one thing that kids block it out and then it comes back years later, right? That was that description of the guy in Vietnam, he blocked it all out. But I, I have a friend who was raped as a child. Her dad got her mother drunk and then used to go have sex with his children um and she blocked it all out she really didn't remember and then when her daughter went into puberty and then also in the news there was some news about uh somebody who had blocked and she just she went crazy like she collapsed and um no, actually it was, it was, her daughter was much younger. There was some news in the news about it and it triggered her and she started having these flashbacks. But then when her daughter went into puberty, her father tried to move closer to her. And then again, it was just huge. But, but the thing is a kid, if you know the kid has been raped, then you can hopefully start them the process to be a little easier because you create a safe zone for that kid and don't let them have any exposure to that person. Um, anyway, but the idea is they have to be safe enough to be able to process stuff. Um, and that is like that, Alicia, that's like the myth of Psyche and Eros, where the, you're in love with love, you realize that that's the trauma. That's where you know you have to break all these maps and go back, how did that happen? Like, what was it about my background that caused me to sort of throw all my deep instincts onto that person? Then you have to go get the ram, you have to get in a safe zone before you can really start, you know, exploring and, and setting up the kind of map you really want. But, you know, life isn't linear like that. It's you're in the middle of a zillion things at once, but overall, you know, you gotta sort of do these four things. Um, does that make sense to you, Alicia? Yeah, okay. 
you're muted, but actually I can read your lips at this point. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think I can read the lips when people are saying that makes sense yeah. or else I want to read their lips. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense to you? Anyway, so that's why he emphasizes choir, you know, music, physical education, movement, all that stuff is creating a safe space. I mean, we are social and political. And the Greeks had all that, like they have the nine muses, music, dance, poetry, erotic poetry to bring to, bring to mind your sexual obsessions, right? Bring them up, tell stories, Here's about somebody that acted on that fantasy. You don't want to do that. And here's about, you know, positive outlets. Here's about the, in, in Homer, in the Iliad, it has two examples of faithful wives. One of the wives in Phoenicia, her name was Arete, which means excellence. So you have always have examples of the goal. There's always some character in there that represents where you're going. And then through the eyes of that character, you can see how far these other people are from getting there, right? Some of them are heading in the right direction. Some of them are completely corrupt, um, but there's always that light at the end of the tunnel. There's always that goal, that, that torch that you wanna pass on to the next generation is each generation should be judged by whether the torch that they were given, did they pass on a better world or at least not a worse world? And in my generation's case, I think we passed on what appeared to be better, what's actually a lot worse. And I, that's kind of why I wanna keep teaching is because I don't want to sit and try to stick it to all the guys that got popular for ignoring the stuff that I care about. And instead, I'd rather teach students and say, I'm sorry, and I'll do everything I can to help you cope with the world that my generation has dumped on you. Um, but anyway, we'll see how that works out. Um, anyway, so the Greeks, and then the bad behavior. So in Greek tragedy, you will get examples of kids who are, who are living out their parents' flaws and the parents don't get it. You know, you get, you don't get, I mean, Mr. Van der Kolk explains it in a rational way, right? He's giving this explanation, but that doesn't cure a person who's doing it. They might even be able to tell themselves they're doing it. They do it anyway. The cure, the Greeks just thought it's much better therapy. It's much better for altering your neural maps if you have a tragedy, if you have this story and you see all these people interacting and all of a sudden, you know, you can, and I mean, sometimes a person, person who's really defensive they might say, oh, my brother does that. You know, they'll right away, they can see it in other people. And then it'll plant that seed in them. And maybe someday they'll catch on. Oh my God, that's me. And, and what I'm saying to Mr. Damasio is that the Greeks had more insight about how to really break those maps and really reform them than Spinoza did. Because Spinoza has the talking cure, just talk yourself out of it. And I just like, no, that's like a, that's like a preacher, right? Do preachers, they always, you know, and then they'll threaten you with hellfire, you know, they'll use pleasure and pain to try and control your behavior. It doesn't work. I just think Greek tragedy, they had insight. And if the people would understand that 
the, the Greeks would understand, you go to a tragedy to expose all this crap and to help, you know, to help all of us become more reflective and also to break those negative <laughs> mappings, break those synapses, and then reform them in this direction. You know, it's not just breaking down, it's because you want to be more like that, right? Um, all right, so I didn't get very far. Let me see. Social engagement. Um, there was there he, he understands the value of these age old approaches, but again, he and he emphasizes breathing exercises, drumming, and that Greek tragedy had a lot of music in it, and it had a lot of sort of with a beat kind of music and the chorus. I mean, it was poetry because it was rhythm, it was dance, it was really trying to appeal to as uh, the neural maps, you know as much of your neural mapping as it could um, uh, help shift people out of fight flight. So that would be help shift people from those emotions because of that trauma into a space where they could start being reflective. But the first step of that is just within a community. Right, it's not in a vacuum. You can't do it on your own. So, um, so now they they feel safe and they can start to relate to each other. Um, okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Damasio also has you know this kind of high tech measuring of which part of the brain goes neat neat. You know, in those brain scans. Um, so they have the evidence. They have, he's confirming that there's a mind body connection. But when he tries to figure out, you know, how are we really going to work on this? Um, that's where I think Mr. Van der Kolk would notice in Mr. Damasio that he didn't bring in enough of the Greek tragedy of this kind of stuff. Um, all right, so the diagnosis just focuses on behavior, not on the cause. And the cause is not just the, you know, brainstem disruption, but the cause is also that they haven't, they need to get the cure is a safe environment and new relationships with people within a social context. Um, the diagnostic doesn't work and psychologists, a certain branch of them are complaining about it, but it made a lot of money. Guess what, right? He's pretty suspicious about money. Um, yeah, maybe, did you see here where he said the national funds most research and you can't get the research unless you're doing this diagnostic stuff. Yeah, um, there are there are some articles that I have read on this DSM five issue, and I don't know. A lot of it is if the cause isn't biological, then it's not good enough. Yeah, I mean, just look at this. Yeah, the model is that you can do it the same way you do cancer. Right. And it's ridiculous. Mental illness is not like cancer. Exactly. Um, the other thing that really bugs me is that my son got cancer because we put our food in plastic. Plastic has an endocrine disruptor. Uh -huh. And that's the way most people have cancer. It's not natural. It's cultural. Yeah. It is cultural also because, I mean, it has a physical, he had neuroendocrine cancer because he has his endocrine system is disrupted. And then you go, oh, plastic disrupts endocrine system. Everything we do is wrapped in plastic. Eh. But that's, I mean, it has a biological cause, but you've got to go to the culture in order to solve it and to the profit motive, right? You have to go to the profit motive. So this woman, 
found out about plastics and endocrine disruption. She had very good research. She took it to the Environmental Protection Agency and they absolutely couldn't do anything about it because the corporations just came after them, right? Because our whole economic system is going to, anyway. But even, you know, so we have physical diseases that are also caused by our economic system and our culture. But, but our mental or disorders not, are not at all like physical disorders. Um, not being able to fit in, right? The social problems. Um, everything is geared toward collaboration. This is where they agree, right? Does that make sense? Damasio and um, Van der Kolk agree. Everything is geared. He said, we are wired for virtue is what Mr. Um, Damasio says. Um, and that's important for understanding suffering. Um, I guess I gotta, it's time to go. There's okay. so much to say. Um, yeah, I'm, we're never gonna get through all of this, but when I, my first reaction, like I'm reading this stuff and going, e -e -e -e. <laughs> and when I, so you can imagine I'm flying in the airplane. Remember that first chapter yeah. of the book? And I hadn't planned on writing this at all, but I mean, e -e -e, so. Yeah, yeah. Then, and then I read Von der Koch and I, e -e -e, but you just kind of wish, you wish that the professionals would get it because they're the ones your average person has to trust. And when you find out they're not trustworthy and because they're actually being corrupted by greed, but most of them don't even know it. Like they think they're helping people, right? Just like people, you know, you have your baby, maybe my baby will grow up to cure cancer. That's such a delusion. And to think that like, that's the goal. It's just terrible. I mean, I just like, couldn't you say maybe my, my son interviewed me in seventh grade once, what's your goal? And I said, well, that my kids would find a job they liked that they that was meaningful made a contribution and it was satisfying to them and that they knew how to they could have good marriages their in-laws would like them they would be good parents honest to goodness you know if you want your kid to be happy but there's nothing in america that is not you're supposed to say no, no, my son will get rich or my or famous yeah. or cure because that's not what flourishing means in america today yeah, yeah, not even close. Yeah. And and if you think of it in terms of your neural maps, mm -hmm. that is what you should wish for them. Yes. And if they really get satisfaction about doing, uh, about being a cashier at a grocery store and being able to go home and be a Boy Scout leader or a coach for grade school kids, that's not successful yeah i uh